we had, we had the opportunity and blessing I did of participating in a wedding yesterday with, for our Haitian brothers and sisters, uh, uh, Bernadette and uh, Michelle. So we want to keep them in our prayers uh, following their marriage yesterday here. I'll tell you, it's really interesting to do a bilingual uh, ceremony when you don't speak the language and they don't speak your language. But you know what? It worked. It's amazing what you can do. The announcements are printed in the bulletin for you this morning. I just and draw your attention to uh, a couple of those. We have a new six-week study that's uh, meeting. It's, it started a couple weeks ago, but you're welcome to jump in. It's at the, in the resource room, which is located at the end of the staff hallway off of the lobby. And you can read about what that is. So that's after the service they'll be meeting. Um, if you have uh, plastic grocery bags that you're collecting and you want to offload them, you can offload them here. Uh, Hungry Hearts can use them on Thursday for our, our food distribution and also for our, our grab-and-go meals. The cafe is open and you're welcome to stop by after the service for some refreshment. We are in need of a group or a class that would be willing to take on as their ministry the fourth Sunday of the month. That's the only Sunday that Suzanne hasn't been able to get scheduled, but if you can take that for, uh, for the church, the fourth Sunday of the month, um, just contact Suzanne and she'll tell you what's involved. Somehow, the announcement that I wanted in here for unless I'm blind, um, f for the picnic did not get in. And I'm the one that puts this together, so <laughs> I have no one to blame but myself. So just remember, and you'll see all the information later, and we'll send it out, uh, August the... Where is it? See, it's two things. It's either I forget it or I did it and I forgot I did it. <laughs> it's on the back. Thanks, John. Read about the, the, uh, the uh, picnic there. God keeps me humble every time I walk on the pulpit. Um, so mark your calendar and plan on being with us for the church picnic on the 21st. We have a joint service there at the band shell. It's at 10 o'clock, so we won't be meeting here at 9 and that's important for you to remember. Okay, um, let's prepare ourselves to worship the Lord by listening to our prelude, Savior, like a shepherd, lead us.
If you're able, would you stand with me as we join responsively in our call to worship? We will give thanks to you, O Lord, with our whole heart. We will tell of all your wonderful deeds. Amen. Wonderful words to think on. Let's join together in prayer. God, the protector of all who trust in you, without whom nothing is strong and nothing is holy, pour out your mercy on us so that with you as our ruler and guide, we may live victoriously in this life and in the life to come. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. God sent his son Jesus to give us peace with himself uh, by Christ's offering of himself for the forgiveness of our sins. So we have peace with God and peace with one another. The peace of Christ be with you. Let's share that peace with those around us. Peace to you. Peace. 
In Psalm 96, verse 7 and 8, it says, Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. So when you ascribe something to someone, you give them credit for it. Uh, you, you, you give it over to them. So part of our worship is ascribing to the Lord uh, when we are together, his glory and his strength, uh, the glory do his name as Psalm 96 instructs us. And then it, it concludes by saying, bring an offering and come into his courts. This is a picture of the people of God in Israel coming into God's presence for worship. We come giving him glory and we come bringing an offering uh, of thanks for all he's done for us. So I, I, I encourage you, when you, whenever you come into this place for worship, that you do that. That you give God the glory that he deserves. You, you rightly credit him with the, the strength that is his and that you bring an offering, something that expresses your gratitude and your thanks uh, to him for what he's done in your life. So thank you for your stewardship as you've done that here at First Church and encourage you to continue to do that through these summer months and uh, all through the seasons of the year. Let's come before God in prayer. Lord, we do ascribe to you glory and strength. We know that everything that we have is ours because of your grace and your mercy working in our life. Um, we owe everything to you. You get the credit for every good thing that's a part of our life. Lord, help us to live lives that, ex that show our commitment, our gratitude, our appreciation, our thanks. Lord, work in our hearts and our spirits so that our attitudes reflect worship and praise to you because you so richly deserve it. Thank you, Lord, for your blessing on First Church. Thank you, Lord, for 200 years of faithfulness demonstrated uh, here. Uh, thank you for working in uh, the lives, the hearts, the minds of our forebearers who established this church so long ago and were faithful to continue its ministry. Thank you, Lord, for the spiritual grounding upon which this church was built, for the, the quickening of hearts, the openness of lives to the movement of your spirit. And Lord, just as it was true then, make it true now in us that we are people who pray, who study your word, who are yielded in our life to you. Lord, use us as a congregation. Use us as a people so that the gospel of Jesus will not only be heard from this place, but seen in this place in our lives. We pray, Lord, for our community uh, in which we live for the Chambersburg. I pray, Lord, for all of the, the people who make this a wonderful place to live, our government officials, our police force, our hospital, our, our um, fire departments, the people that keep us safe, our schools, our teachers, and there's the staff there. So many wonderful service um, ministries in this community for all kinds of people. Lord, I thank you for the folks, the people of Chambersburg who care about others and demonstrate that. Help us, Lord, to continue to serve you in whatever way you're calling us. We pray for our country. Lord, we are so torn by our divisions, our differences of opinion, our political stances. Lord, bring us back to that place where we care about each other no matter where we're coming from, and that as one people we care about our nation and we work for it to be a nation that looks to you. We pray for our world. We think about people in Ukraine that continue to suffer through war. We think about our brothers and sister in Haiti that continue to suffer under poverty and chaos. And we think about other places in the world that are hot spots. And God, we ask for your spirit to move. We pray, 
Father, for miracles, that peace might reign, that, that poverty might be overcome, that people might, might be lifted up. We ask, Lord, for you to move. And we thank you that we can ask those things in the face of overwhelming obstacles because we have faith and we believe that you are God and can do all things. And we ask it in the name of the one whom you sent to change this world, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning we continue with our bicentennial highlight. And as uh, Leslie comes forward, we're going to be hearing the story of Larry and Avis Geis. So both Larry and Avis, like so many other stories we've heard, they grew up in the church. Larry grew up in a Lutheran church in Gettysburg, and Avis has been born and raised here at FUMC. And I loved Avis's story. One of the things she talked about was how Sunday school used to look when she was a girl. If you can imagine this, all of the women's, children, and youth Sunday schools met right here in the sanctuary all going on at the same time, and the men's Bible class was over there. She talked about her mom's Sunday school class being called Royal Daughters, which I loved the name. Like, it's a great reminder of how special we are, and it's a great reminder that we're representatives of God's kingdom in the world. I also loved that she talked about how important those ladies were as she was growing up, them and then other ladies from her mom's small group, and how influential those people were in her life. Um, Larry talked a lot about church camp and the impact that that had on him both as a camper and later he went on to be a counselor. And it's interesting that even as a teenager, he was already starting to pour into younger generations. And he and Avis are two of our very many public school teachers in this congregation who dedicated a life and a career to the next generation. And even in retirement, they have not stopped with that. So a few things to lift up that they currently do, they run something called the Senior Games in their community at Menohaven, teaching lawn games and card games and then um, offering this opportunity to compete. I remember one year at the women's retreat, Avis had to teach a few ladies how to play ping pong because they had never learned and she jumped right in there to do that. And Larry has done GED classes here at the church. He also did that financial sense class that we've already heard about the power of that in one of the other spotlights of Vicki Lesher when she talked about how important that was in her life. Um, and personally, Larry has also been a VBS crew leader for our oldest, Rachel, um, which we thought was pretty remarkable that he was out there playing games and doing crafts and going right along with these kids, and he still keeps in touch with her. He still checks in with her to see how she's doing. Um, and as parents raising kids, that is one of the most beautiful things about this church is people that are doing that. And so we thank you for your service and your story. Yes, Larry and Avis, thank you for sharing your time and your talents and your gifts and your strength with this congregation. Uh, it's a blessing, not just to the Lord, but to all of us. So thank you. One of the favorite hymns that were listed here is Hymn of Promise. And that's such a great picture of what God does in our lives. So we're going to sing Hymn of Promise. Uh, as one of their favorite hymns. And if you're able, I invite you to stand as we sing it.
If you please remain standing as Linda uh, comes to lead us in the reading of our scripture this morning. Oh, it's Rachel. The scripture today is Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 8. And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. say thanks for the things you have done for me, things so undeserved, yet you give to prove your love for me, the voices of a million angels cannot express my gratitude. All that I am and ever hope to be, I owe it all to thee. To God be the glory, to God be the glory, to God. Thank you, Karen. So today we're going to continue uh, in the series on prayer. And <clears throat> this is a passage of scripture that comes, it's sort of introductory. It's, it kind of lies between two major um, well-known sections of scripture that are markers of the Christian church. Uh, so, you'll see that in, you know, this is, uh, before this is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, where he gives his, his new ethic for living, kind of takes all of the things, uh, the, the, the key um, social uh, rules and regulations about murder and divorce and, and all these other attributes of religious life, uh, beyond those civil things and kind of adds a, something to them or shifts the emphasis through the Sermon on the Mount. And of course, before all of that is the Beatitudes. And then at the end of that kind of 
putting out this new ethic, Jesus gives this warning to people who would follow him of what not to be like and the example that he lifts up of what not to be like were the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers of the law, that their spirituality should be different from that um, and, uh, and that they are not to be two-faced. They are to be, he's calling for authenticity. He's calling for them not to be um, hypocrites. So in r the immediate context to what Rachel read for us this morning about prayer is the context about practice. Uh, and Jesus says in uh, verses 1 to 4, I'll just read it, what he says there. He says, be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be honored by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now the emphasis there is this idea of, and the word there is secret, um, something that's hidden. And uh, the, Jesus is emphasizing that in doing good works that it's done kind of in, in the quiet, uh, in, you know, that works be done not to be seen by other people. Uh, so that the emphasis of our giving is not about us. Uh, it is about God. It is giving God honor. It is giving God something in our life that delights him. It's a big shift between the focus being on us and what we're doing and the emphasis being on God in what we're doing because we're not making a big deal about ourselves being the primary actor. In it. It's God who's the primary actor. And so... As, that, as he shares that part of practice, what we do, then he goes on to the passage that we're looking at today, practice, now we go to prayer. So similarly to practice, our prayers, in part, should be on the down, on the quiet, uh, in secret, and not as a display for others to be, have attention drawn to ourselves. So he says in verse 5, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly I tell you, they have received their reward in full. So basically we say here is God, as Jesus is teaching us not to have showy prayers, I'll call it that, showy prayers. Now, let me just say what this is not. This is not God saying that, there, or Jesus teaching us that he doesn't like corporate prayer. I've already talked about, preached about us praying together and that God wants us to pray together. God wants us to have conversations with himself with each, and with others in addressing the needs that we see around us in the world and in our church or in our community. So praying aloud with other people is not what's bugging Jesus at this point. That's not what's getting under Jesus' skin here. He is actually, I believe God delights to hear his people join together in prayer to see, well, you know, what did Jesus say? Wherever two or three gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. Anything that you pray with in another, with another person believing, where two or three agree on anything, it's done. So obviously, there's a corporate nature that prayer can have, and that is legitimate, and it's good. So Jesus is not saying, don't pray out loud in front of people in any kind of situation. He's talking about a particular kind of an issue, and that's having to do with showy prayers. Prayers that draw attention to um, ourselves. And, and there was this, so, you know, it's in Jesus' day, I'm, we're trying to think, of oh, what was that like? Um, what's Jesus referencing? What's going on there um, where Jesus has to talk about um, standing in the synagogue and on the street corners to be seen by others? Um, 
And it has to do with the fact that it, it's not like this. It's not us being together in worship this morning. People would go into the synagogue um, and they would pray there. And so there might be multiple people praying at the same time. Have you ever seen, <coughs> excuse me, have you ever seen, well, I'm sure you have, the picture of the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem? Where that's the only part of the temple that exists now. So that's really the only place if people want to pray at the temple where they can go today to pray. And they even write their prayers on a piece of paper and stick it into the cracks there. But, they'll, but they will be praying at the wall. And there will be multiple people praying at the wall. Because that is a personal moment. You know, it's a very personal thing to go to the, to, the, to the wailing wall and to offer your prayer to God there. It's you and God in that moment. And so in Jesus' day, people would come into the temple and pray like that, uh, bringing their petitions. But then there would be people who would be really loud when they were praying, and they might throw into their prayer about thanking God for the opportunity to give this much this week to the temple, or they talk about their you know, keeping the law, or they kind of blow their own horn. You know, it's better to have somebody else blow a horn for you than to blow your own. I think God feels that way. And so they were in there using this prayer opportunity as an opportunity to lift up their ego, to lift up themselves. You see, the way Jesus says it, they love to pray, standing in the synagogues and the street corners, to be seen by others. What is the purpose of prayer? The purpose of prayer is to bring our need or the needs of others to God. For God to hear us. For God to be honored. For God to be called upon. For God to be trusted. For God to have faith placed in Him. That's what our prayers are about. What are prayers not? Prayers are not to be lifted up so that we can be seen by others. Prayers are not to be used as a device uh, whereby people might think better of us because we've prayed. You know, really, I don't know that this is happening much today. I don't know that that happens very often. But I think it, you know, it, it does lead us into some other kind of aspect of understanding what matters in prayer and what matters is um, what's happening inside as well as what's happening outside of us. The prayer is more about our posture. It's more, about, it's, 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 it's more than that. It's more than the words that we use, how flowery or how simple they are. Prayer has a lot more to do about what's going on inside than on what's going on outside. And that's kind of a new idea for Jesus' listeners. That's kind of an interesting thought. It seems to us kind of common, but it wasn't common so much back then. So Jesus goes on and he says in verse 6, But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Now, I just want to say here, you know, we might have the idea that prayer is a private matter. And in many ways, prayer is, but it's not exclusively a private matter. I've already mentioned in this sermon about something I've said earlier in the series that, you know, prayer is not to be exclusively private. Prayer is something that we are to do corporately. And you know that because every Sunday when we gather for worship, we have a time where I pray uh, uh, in, in, our, in, our, in our bulletin, we call it the prayers of the people, and I get to be the representative in that time. That's kind of the priestly function that still exists in the Protestant church, that, uh, that the prayers that are offered in that period of time, I pray on our behalf, and I hope I hit what you're thinking about too, that we're praying to God as a body, the body of Christ. So it's not just private, but it it is intimate. This is what I would rather use. I'd rather have us think about what Jesus is saying here. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. When people come to want to have a talk with me about something, we go into my office, I close the door, and I turn on my little white noise machine 
so that uh, people can't hear what we're talking about for, con uh, you know, for confidentiality, but also it allows us to share, the person who I'm talking with can have the confidence that they can share something that's intimate, that they don't want everybody to know. So I like this idea of intimacy with God when we pray. Um, and what are the benefits of this? What are the benefits of taking some time off away from anybody else in a, in a quiet place where there's no, you know, what are the, intim what are the benefits of that? Well, first, <clears throat> concentration. If I'm by myself in a, in a room with the door closed and I'm praying, I have a much better chance that my concentration will stay focused on what I want it to be focused on. And I demonstrate before you a lot of times that sometimes I'm not as focused as I should be. I don't even know where I put the announcement for the picnic, you know? So there are lots of things going on in all of our lives that can pull our concentration away at any particular time or moment from what we're doing or are to be doing. And when we pray and come into God for a moment, for time of intimacy, we, it's good to f concentrate. And I'm saying this in an era where concentration of thought is sorely challenged. I mean, this thing, I put it on silence when I walk into this pulpit, but most of the days, most of the hours in the week, it's not on silent, and so it's buzzing, it's chirping, it's ringing, it's doing all kinds of things, saying, hey, look at me. But when I want to pray, I just want to look at God. I don't want to be distracted by this or anything else. So Jesus is telling us that. So hear it. Hear it. Jesus wants you to spend some time with him in a moment of intimacy where you can concentrate and focus on what is really important in your life and what is really important regarding him. Because when this thing is buzzing and ringing, or somebody, you know, when I'm in a, a place where there's people around, I do not have the ability to hear very well. I don't have the ability to hear really well normally, you know, and I, I removed myself from a conversation on Thursday night in the kitchen when uh, some of our saints were getting the meal ready because the conversation shifted to men and their ability to hear or not hear. And I just thought, I hear that and I can leave now because it was just getting a little too close to home about, you know, selective hearing. Selective hearing. And, and if I'm going to have selective hearing, I want my selective hearing to be focused on what God is saying. I want to hear. And I want to, be, I want to hear him, most of all, but I also want to hear myself. Because a lot of times there's so much stuff going on and so many, so much dinging and ringing and, and hubbub and the air around me that I can't even think what I'm feeling or what I'm thinking or what's important to me. And so sometimes doing what Jesus says and going into a room, closing a door and praying to God, not only enables you to hear what God is saying, but you know, before you can even hear what God is saying, maybe it's good for you just to sit and listen to what you're feeling, what you're thinking about. Because sometimes we don't even pause to do that. And we don't even know, we don't have self-awareness of what's going on in us. So we want to focus on those things that make, for trans, that make for intimacy with God. And the first place, the first step is going by yourself, closing a door, and sitting to pray. But it also means in that moment that you can be transparent. That you can just be honest with God and not try to cover things up, but you're transparent. That you're vulnerable. Intimacy involves not only that you, sh you, you know, and transparency involves vulnerability. Here's what I'm thinking. Here's what I'm feeling. Here's where I've messed up. You make yourself vulnerable. Intimacy, someone described intimacy as, they broke it down as it's a cute little thing, but I think it has some merit and that is into me see, intimacy, into me see.
here's what's going on in me. The intimacy with involves a desire to know and to be known, to accept and to be accepted. This is the foundational work of prayer between us and God. And what happened when we just talked about this in our Bible study on Sunday, about well, the first thing, Ad, or I guess it was a couple weeks ago, the first thing that Adam and Eve wanted to do when they messed up. They wanted to stop the intimacy. They wanted to hide. They wanted to cover. And we are about reversing what happened in that garden. Jesus came to reverse what happened in that garden and to reestablish intimacy with our maker. So Jesus says that when we do that, when we take these steps, the second part of verse 6, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. You know, God has the ability to see through the trappings to our heart. The other thing we talked about in our Sunday studies uh, on, uh, is we talked about David and how God chose David over his brothers after um, Jesse ran the whole, they had a, like a runway pageant of his sons walking in front of Samuel to say, which one do you want to be anointed king now that Saul's messed up? And, the, and Samuel sitting there watching, him go, watching them go by and saying, no, nope, not that one. Nope, not that one. Nope, not that one got through all of them, and they said, is that it? That's all you got? Well, there's the youngest one who's out watching the sheep. Oh, get him in here. And as soon as David walked in, God said to Samuel, his agent, that's the one. And then there's this little statement, because God doesn't look at the outward appearance. What does he look at? He looks at the heart. And that is true about us. God doesn't care about our outward appearance. What matters to God? What we need to remember is our, it's our heart that matters, not our appearance, not our stuff, not all the trappings of our life, not all the good things that we could accumulate and be like a hypocrite and recount for God if we wanted to start that way with prayer. It doesn't, it's not going to help. It is our heart. That is what matters to God, the heart. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Because he's not just looking at the things that you do. The really secret place in all of our life is our heart. It's our heart where we keep our secrets. But if I'm trying to get intimate and transparent with God, I'm going to open that up and say, here's, what I, here's who I am. In verse 7, Jesus goes on, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think they'll be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows. For your Father knows what you need before you ask. The emphasis there is on honesty in our conversation. It's about open-heartedness. It is about trusting the relationship and about faith. It's not about kind of like being some nervous Nelly who, when we get in front of some kind of authority, we start, start babbling on and gives all the details about why what we did, we did, and what moved us to do it, and that it really wasn't our fault, and, you know, and, you know babbling. You know what I'm talking about? Just kind of going on and on, and like, and, and, uh, <laughs> I, you know, I've been in the listener's seat on the, that end of that conversation. And in my heart, I'm saying, get to the point. Please, get to the point. I don't need all this. Sometimes people have to get it out, and I understand that. And God understands it too. But we're not to be like that. We're not to be like babbling on. God wants us to get to the point. He wants to get to the heart, really. He's willing to listen, but he really is wanting us to, to get to the point of what our need is. And you, you, you go there knowing he already knows. We start there knowing he already recognizes what we need. 
even before we ask it. He's, he's got it in his mind already, and we're just coming to it, you know. And so I think the way to start there, if we want to not be like babbling pagans, thinking they're going to be heard because they got a lot of words, maybe we just come in with a lot of sim- just being simple. Just start by saying thank you and having a heart of appreciation um, and not being self-defense, not being defensive. Um, because, like I said, lots of words don't make God hear us. It's simplicity of thought and the intention of our heart that is best. So remember these two things. First, remember that God knows what you need before you ask him. Remember, Jesus is telling us this, teaching this, and using the words, for your father knows. He's doing something that would have been uniquely, you know, it would have been radically new to talk about God as your father. And, and for them, for those early first-time listeners, they would have recognized, well, God is my father? It's that kind of a relationship? Yes. That is the kind of relationship that we have. Now, I just have to put a little caveat here because I know not everybody here had, great, had a great father. Some, of, some people have had really stinkers for dads. I was blessed to have a great father. I loved my father, and my father loved me. And I have no regrets in my relationship with my father. You may have some. So here's the thing for you. What your father never was for you, God can be for you if you believe it. Um, God can be that loving, listening, caring, compassionate Father that you may have longed for. Maybe you didn't know your Father, but your Father in heaven knows you and wants you to know Him because that's the kind of Father He is. He's the best Father we could have. And that's what we have when we come in prayer. We have a Father who loves us and is there for us. And secondly, we have a Father who not only loves us, we have a Father who knows what we need before we ask and may already be putting the wheels into motion to bring that about. I shared a story on Thursday night with the, 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 the folks that gathered for our Thursday night worship time and meal. And by the way, Do you know that First Church has three worship services? I'm telling you that so that if you can't make it to 9 o'clock one weekend and you can't make it to 11 o'clock, you can come on Thursday night and you can still be part of a worship service here at First Church. And I'm putting that out there to say you're welcome to come. In fact, you're expected to come. And really, I'll go even so far as to say you are needed to come to help us make connections with people in our community. Okay, that's a side thing. Um, let me just say, though, that you know, I shared this story with them about Dr. Helen Rosevier, who was a missionary in Africa, a medical doctor, uh, and a young woman uh, died in childbirth. The infant needed to be kept warm, and the hot water bottle that they had was beyond rep- repair. And so a little girl who was there in Dr. Rosevere's hearing prayed. And this little girl in Africa prayed, Oh God, please send us a good hot water bottle for this little baby and a dolly for her sister so that she'll be okay. That was prayed in the morning. In the afternoon, a package came from England with clothes. And down in amongst the clothes, was a new hot water bottle and a dolly. The package was sent five months earlier. God knew what was going to be needed in that moment. And God knows what you need. And the wheels already may be moving for that need in your life to be met because our Father knows what we need before we ask. So this morning, I would like you to just leave here knowing that Jesus wants intimacy with you. 
And he longs for that. And he makes it possible for you to know uh, because Jesus died to save you from your sin, to give you forgiveness, so everything's good. If you've asked Christ to be your Lord and Savior and you are, you've made confession of your sin and you want a right relationship with him, you have it. Just act upon it. If there's something that's blocking you now, use that intimacy idea. Uh, be vulnerable. Say, God, I'm going to come into your presence. I'm going to go by myself. I'm going to focus on you. I'm going to concentrate on you. I'm going to put everything else out except you. Here's who I am. Here's what I'm struggling with. I want you to know it. I want to be known by you. I want to know you. I'm asking you to accept me as a, a sinner who's needing your forgiveness, and he will forgive. And if you, and then you can come before him, knowing him as a loving father. You don't have to babble. You don't need to make a lot of, be self-defensive. You can just come and let the need be known. And even though God knows what you need before you ask it, he still likes you to ask. He still wants you to ask because it's good for your relationship. So this morning, when you pray as you go into this week, find some time just to get together with your Heavenly Father and build that relationship of intimacy in prayer. Lord, we are so thankful that you are a God who loves us, that you are a God who is not interested in us in, in doing all kinds of exterior things to meet some kind of weird quota. You are a God who just wants us to come, be open and honest with you, recognize you as a loving Heavenly Father, trusting in you, believing in your love and loving you back, and then letting our requests, which you already know, be known because you like it when we come to ask. Lord, bless each person here this week in their prayer life. I pray, Lord, for everybody here this morning that some time of prayer will happen this week where they experience the relationship that you created them to have with you. And I pray this in the name of the one who came to make it all possible, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. If you're able, would you stand with me so we can boldly declare what it is we believe, along with all the rest of the church through the centuries as we share the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
one of the things I love about First Church is that you have a traditional service where we sing traditional hymns because a lot of the traditional hymns have theology and teaching for us that a lot of the contemporary stuff may have also, but not the way the hymns have. So I encourage you uh, to keep this, don't throw this in the recycling today. Take this home and read the words of the hymns here. Make a study of what we've sung today about prayer and about how we can pray and what prayer is. And have your Bible open to look it up and see if what it says here isn't true. And now, may the peace of God and love of the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you today. And may you be inspired through this week to come to the God who loves you in the name of the Son He sent, inspired by the Spirit that's invaded your life, to pray. Amen.